Hello, my name is John Morrow. I'm a professor of material science and engineering at Penn State University. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk today, which is on Lion Glass, Building a Sustainable Future for Architectural Glazing. Uh, this is research that is funded by a seed grant from Penn State's Coco Ziello Institute of Real Estate Innovation. So I'd like to give a big thank you to the Coco Ziello family and all of the other supporters of the Coco Ziello Institute of real estate innovation and additional support coming from Penn State University. Now, lying glass, what is it? Uh, the problem that we're trying to address is the CO2 footprint of the global glass industry, which produces about 86 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. Uh, where does this come from? Uh, more than 90% of this comes from standard soda lime silicate glass. This is the, the common everyday glass that you find in all architectural windows. Most of the glasses that are used for glass jars, for foods and beverages, uh, the glasses that you drink out of um, at the uh, dinner table, they're all made from soda lime silicate glass and it has not changed in a very long time. So if we wanna do something about the carbon footprint of the global glass industry, we need to think differently about soda lime and really have a step change away from this uh, material. Now, why is it called soda lime silicate? It's called soda lime uh, because the three ingredients, the three main ingredients are soda ash, which is sodium carbonate, limestone, which is calcium carbonate, and silica sand, which is silicon dioxide. Uh, now, both soda ash and limestone are carbonate batch materials, which means as they are melted, those carbonates decompose into oxides and they release carbon dioxide in the process. Now, about 20 to 30 percent of the carbon footprint of soda lime manufacturing is due to the decomposition of carbonate batch materials. Um, this accounts for you know, roughly 20 to 30 percent of the carbon footprint. And one way to reduce this is through the use of recycled glass. Uh, however, that leaves the majority of the carbon footprint, about 70 to 80 percent, is due to the energy consumption that is required for the high temperature melting of soda lime glass. Uh, soda lime is melted at temperatures of around 1450 to 1500 degrees C. It is very hot. Uh, and so when you put it all together, soda lime manufacturing contributes about 86 million tons of CO2 each year. Uh, Lion Glass is Penn State's pet pending alternative to soda lime. Uh, this is named after Penn State's mascot, the Nittany Lion, uh, and it replaces soda lime with a completely different family of glass compositions that are based on phosphates rather than based on soda lime silicate. Uh, here's an image where you can see uh, the beautiful clear Lion Glass there. Uh, Lion glass eliminates the use of carbonate batch materials. So there's no more uh, soda ash, there's no more limestone. In fact, there aren't any carbonate batch materials that are used in the melting of Lion glass. Um, also, importantly, Lion glass reduces the melting temperature of glass manufacturing uh, down by about 400 degrees Celsius compared to uh, soda lime silicate. And this leads to about a 30% reduction in the energy consumed during glass melting. Uh, Lion glass has additional advantages beyond the lower melting temperatures and reduced carbon footprint. Uh, namely, it yields uh, over a tenfold increase in the damage resistance compared to soda lime, meaning that it's much more difficult to create cracks in Lion glass. And this can be a path forward toward lightweighting of glass, which has additional environmental benefits because of the reduced raw material consumption, uh, the further reduced energy consumption for melting lighter weight materials and downstream advantages by reducing the the costs and the energy consumed in transportation of the goods. Um, this shows a comparison of soda lime silicate emissions versus lion glass emissions. This is milligrams of gas per gram of gas that gets released. Uh, you can see that soda lime silicate 
uh, has 192.8 uh, milligrams of CO2 released for every gram of glass. So it's, uh, you know, close to 20% um, of the material is, is lost as CO2 um, that is volatilized during the melting process. Uh, compared to lime glass from the batch to melt conversion process, since there are no carbonates used, the only CO2 that is evolved from this batch to melt conversion process is just a trace amount that is already in the atmosphere or any impurities due to carbonates. Instead of CO2, the primary gas that gets released from lying glass melting is water vapor. So we're trading in something that is environmentally harmful, CO2, for something that is environmentally neutral, water vapor. Uh, lying glass, because it was developed uh, based purely on uh, internal Penn State funding, uh, we have uh, actually uh, three patent applications filed now for lying glass with no strings attached to uh, any outside funding source. Um, it has garnered a lot of attention, featured uh, here in BBC News, also uh, in this great video at the, the Big Ten Network that aired during the football games. Uh, our first industrial partner is actually on the container glass side. So Bormioli Luigi is one of the leaders of the European uh, glass industry based in Italy. Uh, we just conducted our first uh, pilot scale trial uh, in Murano in Italy. And you can see some of the cups that were made there uh, with really nice melting quality, demonstrating uh, the scalability of lying glass and the ability to make nice products. Now, what about application of lying glass outside of container glass and towards architecture? Uh, we've got an awesome team here at Penn State working on lying glass. Uh, the leaders of our architectural, architectural team are myself and also my partner in crime here is Dr. Julian Wong, who is an associate professor of architectural engineering. Uh, our experimental efforts in lying glass are being led by uh, my postdoc here, Dr. Nick Clark, as well as my uh, two newest PhD graduates, uh, Dr. Titus Reed and Dr. Brittany Hockey. Uh, leading the architectural effort is our PhD student, uh, Mehmet Oze, who is also the one who prepared these beautiful slides. So big thank you to Mehmet for putting this together. Uh, Alif Ahmed Oze is leading the efforts on recycling of lying glass and color compatibility. And we are fortunate to be joined by two outstanding undergraduate researchers, Julia Chen and Elizabeth Eichel. Uh, now, what are some of the considerations for application of um, lying glass as a building material? Uh, one of the most important things to consider is the energy efficiency of the building. And these U values tell you the heat transfer coefficient. So how much heat is exchanged or the heat exchange rate um, going through various um, parts of the building here. So for example, a roof has a U value that is uh, typically quite low, about 0.16 uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin. Uh, external walls, floors, they also have um, quite low heat transfer values. Uh, the biggest energy loss, however, occurs uh, through windows. And if you just have a standard single pane window without any special coatings, uh, the U value is actually quite poor. It is about two watts per meter squared Kelvin. So that leads to a relatively high um, heat loss. And ways to improve this include uh, designs of more energy efficient, uh, what's called insulated glazing units. So this is use of double paned windows instead of single pane windows, um, filling the gap between the panes with a noble gas instead of um, just air. Also, the design of the frame is really important. And uh, this is showing some um, material that helps to absorb moisture to um, help reduce that as a problem within or between the panes of a double pane window. Um, so it's not just the glass itself, but it's also the design of the insulated glazing unit or insulated glass unit, IGU, uh, as well as the use of coatings on glass. Um, the goal of our work here in lying glass for architectural glazing applications is, first of all, can we produce flat sheets of lying glass? 
Secondly, can we coat line glass to meet industrial glazing standards? And thirdly, can we develop a prototype IGU using um, the fabricated sheets of line glass? And there are a number of steps here involved with making large pieces of line glass. Um, since we are in an academic laboratory, uh, we don't have industrial scale melting in our lab. We need to use crucible melts. This involves preparing the batch materials by mixing the batch, melting, pouring, and in order to get good homogeneity, uh, we actually uh, do multiple melts in order to break this up into small pieces and remelt them to ensure that we can get the highest quality melt. Uh, this has to be followed by annealing at its glass transition temperature in order to ensure that uh, it is stress-free. Uh, my students did a lot of troubleshooting along the way to deal with things like um, thermal shock or um, bubbles that evolved due to um, some sort of interactions between uh, coatings on the mold materials and the glass itself. And when they got the right combination of temperatures for the glass melting, as well as uh, uh, the right type of mold material, um, then they were able to get uh, higher and higher quality melts. And at the end, you can see here on the left, this is uh, Mehmet here, our PhD student, doing the pour of a really nice quality um, piece of lying glass that, that is about six inches by six inches. And here you can see the beautiful quality piece of glass that he uh, produced. Uh, now, when we consider the application of coatings to lying glass, low E coatings or low emissivity coatings, um, the, the goal of these low E coatings is to make sure that visible light can be transmitted uh, from the outside um, into the inside of the building, but reflecting as much of the infrared and UV part of the spectrum as possible. So if you look at the incoming light here, you can see the proportion of infrared versus visible versus UV light. And we'd like to reflect as much of the infrared and the ultraviolet as possible while allowing as much transmission of the visible spectrum. One of the ways to do this is to apply a low E coating um, to one of the panes. This is typically on the order of a um, couple of tens of nanometers. Um, and a typical coating here might involve uh, silver or titanium and titania. And uh, what we're showing here is the emissivity of uncoated sodalime silicate glass and uncoated lying glass, which have exactly the same measured emissivity. Uh, and then if you apply a low E coating, the emissivity goes down uh, substantially. So the range of industrial sodalime silicate with um, you know, industrially coated low E coatings ranges from 0.01 to 0.15. Uh, for lying glass, even with our first um, lab scale coated lying glass, we were falling within that same range. And uh, we expect that the performance uh, will only improve as we go to industrial scale. So we've, we're getting you know, very encouraging results here, both for the formation of lying glass as a sheet glass, as well as the applicability of low E coatings to ensure that not only are we going to reduce the energy consumption in the manufacturing of lying glass, but it's also going to provide good energy efficiency for uh, home and for buildings that make use of it. Uh, one final result here shows the optical trans, uh, transmittance and reflectance of the coated lying glass versus coated sodalime silicate. You can see the uh, percent transmittance um, for uncoated lying glass here in black, uh, where it is uh, actually reflecting uh, or absorbing uh, ultraviolet radiation has a very high transmittance across uh, the visible. Then when you apply the low E coating, you can see that uh, it absorbs a lot more in the infrared while still allowing for a really uh, high visible transmittance um, comparable to that of sodalime silicate. Uh, of course, this is just a lab scale coating. Uh, and then on the right here, you can see the high reflectance of the infrared um, that the, the low E coating is doing its job on both lying glass and on soda lab. So thank you very much for tuning into this presentation. 
Um, we're still at the beginnings of this work, uh, but everything appears to be uh, very promising going forward. And uh, we are really excited about what Lion Glass has to offer in the architectural engineering space. So please stay tuned for more updates in the future. And thanks again to Penn State's Coco Zielo Institute of Real Estate Innovation for supporting this work through a seed grant. Thanks, everyone. If you like the presentation, be sure to click that like button. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them below. All right. Thanks, everyone. I will see you next time.